it's great to see in the city of brotherly love. And there's another, yes. oh, the city of industry. I believe that's what Philadelphia is also called, isn't it? I don't know. Or I call using it, that with like the factory. Um, I just call it my favorite invention. Place. I don't know. It's the birthplace of America. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, I, I need to look this up now. It's the, it's the home of Ben Franklin. Right, right. And Rocky. Right. So nicknames of Philadelphia. Let's see here. Um, City of brother, Brotherly Love. Athens of America. Birthplace of America. Qu Cradle of Liberty. Quaker City. Philly Soul. Uh, <laughs> home of Oats. Uh, the City and that Hall. Loves You Back, which sounds like, that just sounds dirty. It does. It sounds like a bad case of crabs or something. Yeah. So, well, speaking of that. Yes. Um, these people really deserve some sort of prize, I feel like. I don't know what they, they deserve. Did you read the whole article? Uh, yes. They deserve a bath in, like, why? Well, no, I don't well, even these, know. These people last year had got this brilliant idea to have the party, have a party in the back of a pickup truck. Okay. I'm assuming they filled the put the lining in the back of the truck, filled it up with yeah. water, and everybody hung out in the back and had a great time. Yeah. And so spring comes again, summer comes again this year, and you got to one up it, don't you? Okay, you do. But there are some major factors that make the dumpster being the upgrade a huge problem. We should clarify for for the people listening to this who are not in our text chain. This is these, true. These, these child geniuses, these um, <laughs> children of God, had the brilliant yes. idea to rent a dumpster. And let's give them some credit. They did, like, power wash the inside of the dumpster they out. They did. And they did rent it, so it didn't have trash in it prior. Mm -hmm. Currently, right. They lined the bottom with uh, pool noodles, which I'm not yeah. exactly sure why they were giving that detail in there. Then they lined the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then everybody got in and gave each other uh, an STD or, or Corona or who knows. Yeah, all of the above had played Marco Polo. Right, yeah. So, I don't know. It's lined. But, okay. Isn't it just as dirty or worse dirty to be that close to that many people? Well, that's the first. Days? Yes. This is the first and foremost issue. The first and foremost issue is we're in a fucking pandemic. Right. Where being close, not really a great thing. Right. Being close in a very, very dirty metal box, pool liner well, or not, not. Let's not pretend not that you've thing. never been in a dumpster. I've never been in a dumpster. Seriously? No, I've never. This is Why, with your hosts, Heidi Hedquist and Luke Poling. So wait a second, this dumpster pool party, I just looked at this now and I can't even remember who sent this to me. The dumpster pool party happened in 2016. I feel so, I, I don't Wait, know. this is old. This is old. So we can't. So we can't even be mad at them. Oh yeah, it oh, says no. updated three years ago. Right. No, they're definitely all dead by now, right? This is where it all began. The bats. The bats did not start the coronavirus. And this the is yeah. Dumpster really party true. three years ago. Yeah, is what started it. Right, and well, according okay. to, so, I can't believe I. Did Twitter sent steer me wrong? I, I don't know, but I just realized in rereading the the article that the person who said we're not screwing around was the city's PR person. <laughs> <laughs> there you that go. That makes me so happy. Oh, yeah, Karen Gus, communications director for the Department of Licenses and Inspection. She just must be thrilled somebody's calling her. Let's be honest here. True. And then the caption here on the photo Apparently, a trash bin full of water makes a great swimming pool. Who knew? Like you've never been invited to one. I haven't. I'm feeling very well, left out. No, no. I'm saying just the, the, the author of this is saying oh. it's very, uh, you know, I mean, I guess the dumpster next door 
is always greener than. And this is yes. like the, so there's the whole, whole, the last line of the article. One thing is for sure. We can't wait to see what the block party does next year. Which is nothing, right? We're going to be in ICU at best. Right. Look at the photo. There's a child in there. Wait, wait, are you Where sure it's not Mar Wait, maybe it's just Martha Quinn. No, it, oh, that could be Martha Quinn. That's I think true. it's Martha Quinn. Very tanned Martha Quinn. Oh, it Quinn. is a, very, a topless, very tanned Martha Quinn. Yeah, oh, and that, then that is in a child. the left-hand corner, it looks like two people are, are they trying are, to create. They are. Lo love to is create inspired. Love. Yeah. Look at, there are two couples, like, there's a lot of couples, actually. Look yeah. at the dude laying on the floaty with the PBR awesome. and the girl. No, someone is... I know what they're doing for the party next year. They're having a baby well, shower. Well, and look at the people. Wait, look at the people like in the foreground, the couple. And then there's the other guy under the one girl with the tattoo's arm. And the other girl's like looking at like there is a whole mm. lot of swappy oh, swappy yeah. happening there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I see that. There and, is a the, is the there a place you can put your key at the dumpster party? Because there is a definite key party. Maybe that's what. Martha Quinn is doing is just carrying a, like a Ziploc bag full of keys so they don't get wet. And the, or the maybe that, door. right. Maybe what it is, is it's like the old thing where you'd put the dive sticks at the bottom. You drop all the keys at the bottom and you got to dive down and get them. Oh, interesting. Okay. The dumpster party's looking up now. But now here's my question. So this, this tattoo gentleman with the, with the beard. Yeah. Scratching clearly, his eyes. Yeah. Clearly um, in for the weekend from Brooklyn. Totally. Is that... Is that glass in his hand? Did he bring glass to a dumpster pool <laughs> party? I think he totally did. <gasps> that looks like a bona fide Pilsner glass. Yeah, that does not seem like a great... And there's a child there. Or Martha, <laughs> or Martha Quinn. Quinn. <laughs> yeah. Wait, so... Well, it's no wonder the chick in the black is leaving him for the other bearded dude that looks just like him without glass. He's like right, the safe yeah. version. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then actually, look, the photo the photo itself is captioned. Um, apparently, <laughs> a trash bin full of water makes a great swimming pool. We've been over that. Courtesy, <laughs> Michael, whatever it is. Yeah. Courtesy. So, Mike, I'm going to assume was like no you put your arm here you go there martha quinn you get in the corner back <laughs> up there what was your first reaction when they came to you and said we want to do a movie about you i had had that on my bucket list for a very long time um i always wanted to tell my story and tell it properly i always have gotten annoyed through the years that Nobody's ever done the story right. They 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 make it bullshit. I'm the first one. Mm -hmm. You want a story? Here I am. I did it. I didn't have a blueprint. So I'm the one that can tell the story. So I've always wanted to just put the record straight. Tell you what it was like. You know, it wasn't always easy. I had, you know, hurdles to overcome and family problems and this and that. And I didn't make it right away. And so I wanted to show what it took for me to walk down the path of what I did, and nobody had done it before. So it's not like I had a blueprint that I could say, oh, that's what I want to do. That didn't exist. Right. So I just had to hold on tight to me. I had to hold on to who I was. And I'm pretty much like that now. I will not compromise for anybody. You had such foresight and strength and intuition and the ability to hold on who you are in a world to who you are in a world where Nobody seems to hold on to who they are. How, how did you manage to do that? It's amazing. I think it was both. It's a double-edged sword because um, when you're one of five kids, you know, you, you are looking for your voice. Any big family person would tell you that. And I was kind of like the horse they didn't bet on. But I, I bet on me. I bet on me. I knew who I was and what I was capable of. I knew it from a tiny girl. And... Once I found my voice, I, I just wouldn't let it go. That's that's my message. Mm -hmm. And when I got my, um, I'm jumping ahead of the story, but it seems to be important right here. When I uh, got my honorary doctor degree at Cambridge University, which is just surreal. <laughs> don't even, I don't yeah. even, have, I don't have a diploma. So 
I had a speech written here next to me, and I looked at the sea of intellectuals. I'm going, how did I get here? And I just threw the, the speech aside, and I found myself saying the following. Then I cried. I said, um, it doesn't matter. All you, I'm looking out at this sea of people. I said, uh, you know, it doesn't matter your, your color, your race, you know, male, female. doesn't matter. Each and every one of you, your job in life, you have a light. We all have a light. Go in there and find it. Switch it on. And let nobody ever switch it off. And then I cried. That's my message to the world. Find and your life. We've all got it. You know? Yeah. And it seems like that's sort of the mantra you've kind of lived by for your whole career. Did you have that feeling going to London by yourself? You know, yeah. coming out of Detroit? Yes, it was... Um, it was, you know, I, I was always waiting for the tap on the shoulder. I'm not going to lie about it. And uh, I've, I've talked about it with many other people. What other word can you call it? It's called X Factor. Let's just use that as an example. Right. Okay. It's, it's it, you know, you sound like you're bragging. I'm not. I'm just telling you what I knew I had. Mm -hmm. You know, you and, and anybody that has that goes, yeah, because you just know it. You know it from a tiny kid. Um, and if that was my calling card that was going to get me through life then I better know it and I better use it you know so I just I just always knew that I was going to get come over here I'm going to get the tap on the shoulder so it came came twice in one week and in the band that I was playing in it was the first time for like 18 months out of nine years that I was in the background and I only did a few songs a night and basically just played so I got really good on my bass at that point. But <laughs> but the two record companies within a week saw me. And both record companies didn't like the band. I was at the back. I came up, did two songs from back. They both offered me a solo contract. So it's a no-brainer, isn't it, really? So when I when I finally found out, which my family didn't tell me, as you saw in the film, they didn't tell right. me that they wanted me, which it, it, it's bad because... Um, Mind you, I would, I would have gone and, and made it anyway because that's my nature. You know, even, maybe it would have taken a bit longer, but somebody would have found me somewhere and I would have heard it. But I went, and it was very sad leaving them. Yeah, it was. I was leaving everything I knew, my family, my band, you know, everything. But there was no way that I wasn't going to take this chance, you know. So I just sucked it up and was lonely and cried myself to sleep and did what I had to do to keep my voice, my voice. And I am the kind that will not compromise myself for anybody. I won't do it. I won't. Well, well then consequently you changed the world. By honoring your voice, you opened up a pathway for so many other voices. I know, and it's. I, I was saying to somebody a little while ago, it, this is all hindsight because I didn't. I didn't do it thinking I'm going to do it for the girls. That, that wasn't even in my head. All I was doing was being me. And I didn't know this was happening until it happened. And then I went, Jesus Christ, what did I do? But <laughs> oh, as, as hindsight, you look back on it and, you know, you get people like Debbie Harry and Cherie Curry and Kathy Valentine. And Cherie gave me an award at the She Rock ceremony and she started to cry. And I just kind of went, and then I was doing an interview with Kathy, who also gave me an award in Texas, and Cherie. And we're talking, and Kathy started to cry. And I'm going, then I had my friend from the Baby Alamos, uh, Susie DiMarchi. She came over, stayed over, went up to the ego room, and she started to cry. So when I look at these things now, what I realize is I think without meaning to, I gave permission for these women who didn't fit anywhere. And all of a sudden they had a place they belonged. And that's why they cry. I called out to them. I said, you can do this, you know, not knowing it just by being me. So that is a pretty wonderful thing to take to my grave when I go. Yeah. yeah. And did, did yeah. you have the feeling that you need needed to ask permission? You didn't, yeah. did you, who was your sort of the person you looked up to and said, I, I if I could yeah, be like that person. I didn't ever ask any permission for anything in my life. Um, and I've been told by some of the toughest people in the business, 
that nobody tells me what to do, but you can suggest. <laughs> <laughs> and don't I look guilty? That That is a guilt. <laughs> I, I know that makes me laugh because I know I am like that. I am like that. Um, I don't do gender. I never have. My hero was Elvis Presley from the time I was six. And I watched him on TV and I had the light bulb moment at that age. This is absolutely true. I went, I'm going to do that. And I knew it. So I just always... I knew I was different. I knew I didn't fit anywhere. That's the thing. When you know, if you don't fit anywhere, you got to find a place to fit. So I created my own niche. That's who I am. It's amazing. So I'm a. Lou's gonna laugh. Here at we me. go. <laughs> I grew up in Detroit. I'm in Detroit right now. When I was eight, I moved to London, and I grew up worshiping leather tuscadero i worshipped you as leather tuscadero i wanted to be you i wanted everything <laughs> inspired everything about it when we moved to england all of my friends worshipped you for all the amazing things you had done musically that here as your fellow detroit hometown girl i hadn't experienced yet until no because a, a lot of you in america got acquainted with me through that show even though i had been there doing lots of tours right. and lots of album airplay it, right? re it really cemented from that show. So in America, I'm known as the girl who plays on the Tuscadero. Everywhere else in the world, they say, weren't you on that show? What was it called? Happy Days? Right, right. <laughs> like, wait, you did that too? And but it doesn't matter. Leather Tuscadero broke down the door and so did Susie Quattro. And guess what? We're the same person. Right. <laughs> but was it from the musical side of it, was it odd living across the world and having people back here not necessarily having experienced all the incredible things you were doing as they were happening, not discovering them until later or until other people are saying how incredible you are. That had yeah. to be kind of surreal. It, it was It was a little bit strange. I had to do a different set when I toured America. I started touring there in 74. So it wasn't filled with hits. It was filled with my albums, which is all my own stuff. Um, I just kept thinking, oh, you're just taking time to catch on. You'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you'll get it. <laughs> And they did. And now I'm in the happy position of America rediscovering me. So that's a nice thing to have at 70, isn't it? That's awesome. Yeah. Amazing. And that's the great thing about, yes, about at the 70. film, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Building off of what Heidi was asking, what was Joni Cunningham like as a bandmate? Aaron. As a leader, I... let's say, band leader. <laughs> She, she was, she came in as a, one of the uh, suede's just for one episode. <laughs> she was a nice girl. You know, I liked her. She had some problems later on. Those problems were not evident when the show was going on. I think those problems came later when she didn't have that to hang on, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. She was very involved in I'm very good friends with Ronnie still. I'm very good friends with Henry still. As you can see, he's in the film. Yeah. And in fact, Henry's, Henry's comment really gets me. I love what he says. That's and I awesome. love it. I love how he says it. He means oh, it. You my, can tell. Oh, yeah. My, my, my son pointed out to me that, um, as opposed to other documentaries, and I think you'll probably agree, everybody in this film is in there because they want to be in there. And they're speaking from their heart. And you really feel that genuine, don't you? That mm -hmm. genuine coming out. And it's so heartwarming and it's so humbling. When I saw it on the big screen, I just cried the whole time, you know, because it's, well, you know, you think to yourself, geez, you know, like <laughs> Debbie Harry, she's a friend of mine. I, I wanted to do something that the director wouldn't let me do. I, I'm mad at him, but I suppose he's right. When Debbie says, when Debbie says in the film, Susie Quattro was so beautiful. I wanted my voice to come under it as a, <laughs> as a fuck off, Debbie. <laughs> Now, wouldn't it have been amusing? Yes. <laughs> but he said, no, let the compliment go. <laughs> you, know, you know, a lot of compliments you can take, you know, but I, I can't take Debbie Harry telling me. You know, sorry, what doesn't compute? Right. <laughs> well, it's it was, it was a lovely thing for her to say. I just, I really wanted to do that. <laughs> oh. Yeah, we would have let you do that. <laughs> Fuck off, that's the, yeah, that's the kind of shenanigans we've encouraged. <laughs> yes. And you did.
did a This Is Your Life on the BBC, and this film is essentially a This Is Your Life. I mean, you've had now twice the sort of Tom Sawyer version of getting to sit there and listen to everybody speak your praises. I mean, that's got to be really nice and fulfilling. And to see, you know, in 90 minutes, here's your whole story and here's the, the reach you had, like we were talking about earlier. It's amazing. It's amazing. that That's what affects me when I watch it on the big screen. I just go, yay, 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 yay. You know, I have in my house an ego room, right? Everybody should have one. <laughs> and this is how I've survived all this. And, and I'm very normal, as you can see. I'm a very normal person. Right. Um, yeah, I get, well, my, one of my friends went, eh. Yeah. <laughs> um, she's not here anymore, so eh, to you. Um, I have to go up. This is how I handle my life. The ego room is on the top floor of my house. So you go up two flights of stairs. And on the third floor where it is, it's crooked. The wall, you can bang your head. It's an old 15th century house. So you have to be very careful to get to this ego room. And then you get there, and there's a very heavy wooden door. And I had a plaque made. And it says, ego room, mind your head. <laughs> and you go in, and it's full on the table you see the red book this is your life so poignant it's got clothes down one end suits you know my lots of different jumpsuits jacket from happy days all the different clothes three bases in the corner videotapes off in order all the way around cds dvds pictures in every single space available stage things scrapbooks you know the what do you call them the passes everything mm -hmm. and you can go in there and sit there and you can Enjoy everything Susie Quattro, and it's very quiet up there. It's the quietest room in the house, which is funny for an ego room. And then when you come out, the important part is, for me, is I close the door. Yeah. And that's how I handle this business. I love it. That makes sense. I mean, I've heard stories of Neil Young going into his archives and being surrounded by every recording of Cortez the Killer and basically saying, I got to get out of here. This is creepy. I mean, it's similarly where it's like, I can visit, but I can't stay long. No, I can't stay long. No. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just, it, it, but it is a beautiful room. I love it up there. My granddaughter was helping me do it. She was about 12. My daughter was here. She helped me. And then she went home. My granddaughter stayed. And I was, I gave her the job of taping some pictures back into scrapbooks where the tape had worn off, you know. So she's mm. taping. Taping, taping for about another hour we had read it all day and she turned to me and she said grandma i have to go downstairs and i said what's the matter she said i can't look at you anymore <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> that's great what is that like being able to share such an amazing legacy with a granddaughter with a grandchild of any gender she loves it oh she loves it i when i go out with her you know I get stared at a lot because, I mean, I'm very known. So my face, even I had a mask on. I had a mask. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I had a mask on in the shop just yesterday. And I said something to somebody. She went, are you Susie Quattro? I said, are you kidding me? Oh, my God. But it's cool to do that. She thinks I'm cool. When I try to which I don't really do, but if I ever put a hat on or something like that, and I'll say, you know, this doesn't seem to be working, this little bit of a disguise, and she says to me, it never works, Grandma. You always look like you. And when you put something on, you look more like you because you look like you're hiding, you know, so. <laughs> anymore. But it's fine. Um, if I had grown up with, um, it's, it's good in a way. I didn't grow up at all looks identified. Not at all. Um, and imagine if I had, and then you get to that stage where you're a sex symbol and you're on everybody's walls, that must really mess with your head. But because yeah. I didn't grow up that way, it's just like, it, it doesn't mean anything. It's thank you, but it, you know, you, you don't take it serious. You just don't take yeah. it serious. So in a way that saved me. Interesting. So what have you been up to recently with the, the lockdown? I know you were scheduled to play Detroit and, and do all, all this stuff. The gigs, all the gigs were canceled. So our first gigs now in the book are in September, which is horrible. That's really bad for the entertainment industry. I was yeah. supposed to 
and Frisco to do the first film premiere that got canceled. Um, but now we're doing all the interviews now. Um, when the lockdown came, my son should have been on the road. I should have been on the road. Uh, we have, I have a studio in the gardens and the company who did my current album, No Control, which has just had rave reviews that I did with my son, uh, they took up the option. So all of a sudden we're both grounded. I said, Richard, let's write the album. So during lockdown, we have written 14 songs. I have assembled a illustrated coffee, set, coffee table size um, lyric book similar to my poetry book. It's now at the printers. I've worked on my movie script, which is coming next, and we will be delivering that mid-July. Um, and I'm starting on my next idea for a book. If I can't create, I'm dead in the water. I have to communicate, create, and entertain. Th then I'm happy. Then my cycle is complete. So I've been using my time. I've been doing bass lines on the internet, you know, Susie Quarter's bass line. Everybody's loving those. I've been doing Susie Sunday specials where I play a song at the piano. So I'm trying, I tried in my own way to lift the mood as the entertainer that I am. I'm not getting paid for it. There's a lot of work that goes in, you know, but mm -hmm. the, the comments from people, they've gone, oh, we wait for this every more. I say, oh, that's nice. Thank God, you know, I can do something to alleviate it, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's got to be hard as an artist being stuck in this place where your creativity is continuing to go. But it tries. Well, that, that's why I have to be creative and do something. I actually put on Facebook not that long ago. I said, oh, my God. OK, I don't know. what I don't have a, a schedule in my hand. I don't know when the flight is. I don't know where the hotel is. I don't know where Tom Soundcheck is. My bag is packed and I'm rolling it. Who am I? And they all said, don't worry. I said, who am I? And, you know, and a lot of the musicians answered, oh, God, we're there with you. You don't know what to do with yourself. If somebody doesn't tell me what time I need to be somewhere, I don't know what to do. Because my whole life has been running a schedule. There's yeah. always, always something is slotted in, you know? Yeah. So you had to sort of my last one now, you know. So then I've crossed it out, and then that's the then then it's my time. Yes, then it's movie time. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. When you look back on all of the incredible things you've done thus far, because clearly there is a whole lot of other great stuff coming, just waiting for quarantine to be lifted. Is there a? And I know it's impossible to do this, but is is there a particular moment? for someone who maybe isn't familiar with all the things you've done that stands out as the most pivotal moment in your career? Oh, God. Oh, that's hard. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, happy days, you know, watch that. Watch any of the early shows that I did, you know, when, when you're playing in front of thousands and it's just you. I mean, the one that just came to mind was when I turned 50, I was doing the biggest outdoor gig in Germany, and I played to 22,000 people on my wow. day, and they brought a cake out. That's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. If you're going to turn 50, <laughs> right? <laughs> do it that way. There's been some pretty wonderful moments in my life. A lot of them are in the documentary. Um, the best place to start is with my with my hit. Start there. Yeah. Oh, and then you mm -hmm. get to about me and you educate yourself and i would say don't watch happy days till you're further down the line of who i am and then yeah. you can, i slotted into that now that became yeah. part of me and um yeah i mean i'm dr quattro now you know i know <laughs> from cambridge no less <laughs> yeah, i didn't graduate high school which i think it's it's me going <laughs> yeah <laughs> fantastic right i mean it's Truly, so much of what you've done is what so many people dream to do, but don't have the strength to listen to that small voice inside of them telling them that, yes, you are as special as you believe you are, as, as you know you are. And yeah. just to hear that story and hear how you've done that, I think is so inspirational for people to go, you know what? I can do this. If she can do this from Detroit and move this to is what the girls say. Herself, this is what right. all the girls say. I gave them permission yeah. to be yeah. something different. Right. How great is that? Oh, my God. You can be anything you want to be. Mm -hmm. I'm all for that. 
stay true to yourself. It's all your. There's a song on my on my current album that everybody agrees. Everything I've written, I've written so many songs. If you if you say to me which song is you, you'll have to play that. Um, it's me, and it's called No Soul, No Control. It's the first track on the album, and it there's a video of it on YouTube. Awesome. The word the words are completely me. I've never written a more true song. And it's what we're discussing. That's what made me think of it, you know? Awesome. Love it. All you got, all you got is you at the end of the day. You got you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's true. I think I'm talking to you. Because <laughs> we're <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching your your face. I'm a real good people reader, so I'm watching. <laughs> and, and, and you're relating to that big time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. No, it's a it's amazing. All, and it's so true. It's it's so true. And people people are scared of themselves. I think there, a lot of yeah, times they are. There, there's one line in the movie. Whenever I hear it, I go. It, it confuses me. One of my sisters says it, and. And you'll get this. She says, um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Susie's always going. She won't let anybody <laughs> stop her. Not her family, not her husband. And I'm thinking, as soon as she said it, I went, why would? Right. <laughs> uh, why would anybody want to stop anybody? I don't get where that comes from. Do you? No. Why would you, why would you stop somebody? Why, why stop somebody on their path? What harm am I doing to anybody else following my road? Yeah. Well, yeah. I thought that that was something you were, you know, very forthright in the documentary and really allowed people to see kind of the reality of, of the struggles of coming from a large family right. and your path right. being different. And it was really wonderful for you to allow yourself to be that vulnerable, even for your family to participate as well. And I think... That's a huge benefit that will come from viewers too, because we all grow up in situations where we're like, oh, or, man. or we do. And and I I had editing scissors, you know, I I had editing scissors. And I, <laughs> well, you have to. It's my right. life. Right. And mm -hmm. I said I said to the director because I'm, if nothing, I'm honest. I am. I'm a, I'm a no bullshit girl. I'm an honest girl, straightforward. You might not always like what I say, but at least you get the truth from me. I won't bullshit you. But saying that everybody has their own truth, sure. And I said to him, I won't, I won't use the editing scissors for anything that is important and it's true and it's somebody's opinion. So maybe somebody says something I'm uncomfortable. If that's how they feel, that stays in. And I kept true to that. And this is what people are reacting to. Sure, it's painful. It's hard to watch. But I gave them the chance to speak. I didn't write the questions. I was nowhere near the interviews. And they spoke their mind. So why shouldn't that be in there? This is how they feel. And that's okay. I mean, it's hurtful, sure. But but why shouldn't they be able to say, they don't have to say, oh, she's wonderful. They're never going to say that. No, because Debbie Harry's going to say that. I was going to say Debbie Harry's <laughs> bad. Yeah. And, and, and I'm beautiful. Don't forget that one. Right. <laughs> She's saying that. I don't care if she was lying. She's saying <laughs> I'm pretty sure Debbie probably wouldn't lie either about something like that. <laughs> I've got a little um, email from her because we are friends. And I printed it out and I framed it. It's up here on my board. She, she wrote to me, whether you know it or not, you are a true genius in every sense of the word. I just went, See, that gets me misty-eyed. What a lovely thing to say. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Wow. And I think it also says something, too, about your personality, about just who you are, that all these people are not only willing to say this stuff for you, but are so, you know, we're involved in the film, agreed to sit down with everybody. Like, that, that takes some time. And that they are all willing to do it for you, I think, says a lot about who you are and how important your work has, has been to them. It's humbling. It is humbling. When I watch it on the screen, I just go, <laughs> I snuck in and I'm going to have to go in a minute. When I, yeah. I snuck the first um, premiere that I did here in London at Regent street, it was sold out. And I was so nervous because I hadn't seen it on the big screen and I hadn't seen it with an audience and no audience is predictable. You know, and going, oh, my God. But they reacted in every part like I thought they would. But I was standing on the side 
And I was just in tears the whole time. Sometimes happy, sometimes sad. It just really blew me away. I kept going, I did that, I did all that. I was, I did, oh my, he said. <laughs> the documentary Susie Q is having a virtual premiere this Wednesday, July 1st in the USA and Canada. And it will be followed up with a Q&A with Susie. For tickets and to learn more information, go to suzyqmovie.com. Be sure to follow Why the Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And check out our YouTube channel for some additional great Why content. If you're so inclined, please leave us a review and let us know how we're doing. Today's show is produced by myself and Heidi Hedquist, our reluctant executive producers of John Sove and Sandy Stone. Our graphic designer is Samantha Mustonen. Our intern is Randy Jeanette. The theme song was performed by the Electrosynthno Magnetic Polyphonic Orchestra. This one's for Philippe. Thanks for joining us. Flash, we're coming home. Nigel, is that you? Are you here, Nigel?